Well, we'll let's let's go for a walk and see if we can find something. See, here we have here we have what eggshell fragments. Those? Yeah. Well, now, how little... in the world did you did you see that? <laughs> I, I would never well, see those little those little tiny eggshell. things. Eggshell is really pretty common out here. In fact, it's one of the most common fossils we have in the formation. But when we find a real concentration of thousands and thousands of pieces, then we know we have a we have a nest. Mm -hmm. And what we've been doing is is combing the the areas looking for other nests, and we've come up with eight more. So we know that that these dinosaurs nested in colonies. Horner had discovered the eggs of a plant-eating dinosaur. Right. It grew up to 20 feet in length and produced eggs in clutches, 20 at a time. Weighing in at about a ton, how did these dinosaurs incubate their eggs? Did they care for and feed their young or simply abandon them? The answers have revolutionized our ideas. The name Jack Horner gave this plant eater, Myasaura, sums up how he believes dinosaurs behaved. Can you tell me what this is? It's nest of a... Myasaur. Nest of a Myasaur. Myasaur means the good mother lizard. When did Myasaurs live? A real long time ago. 80 million years ago, right? Do you think dinosaurs sat on their eggs to incubate them? Nope. Like no. birds do? No. Why not? Crush them. That's right. They'd be flat, wouldn't they? That's right. So, what we think is that the dinosaur, the mother dinosaur, covered the eggs with vegetation, and then the vegetation would begin to rot. And when things rot, it creates heat, and so that heat would have warmed the eggs. That's a pretty neat way to do it, isn't it? Now, now what, what are your clues that have led you to believe that the, the mother dinosaurs cared for their young? The ends of the bones uh, of the babies in the nest are not very well formed. Uh, they would have had a very large cartilaginous cap, which means that the babies couldn't walk. And they're little plant eaters, and therefore, if they couldn't walk, we assume that the parent would bring food to them. We find some other stuff of these dinosaurs, too. In fact, we find dinosaur stuff, and we call it coprolites. You know what coprolites are? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, dinosaur stuff. Yeah. We find those in the nesting grounds. And so we can look at that, those coprolites, and we can tell what the dinosaurs ate. And we know that the Baby dinosaurs were eating berries, like you see the mother feeding them. We have what we call a coprolite, which is a dinosaur dung. Oh. And we have some people working on it. it looks just like a sort of a black rock. My but, gosh. But actually what we have here is a, is a is a rock that is just loaded with plant material, all this black in here. And it's mixed together with the sediment. When I was a dinosaur detective, that looks like a rock to me. It certainly does. And, uh, <laughs> but what would make you look at it like that? What we were finding were these sort of big blobs of, of what appears to be crushed up plant material. It's very rare out here, but we're only finding it in the nesting ground, the nesting horizons. Another clue is the shape of the skull. When we look at the baby dinosaur skulls, they have the same features that we see in birds and mammals. They have very big eyes, big brain, very short snout. It's the characters that make things like Mickey Mouse cute. <laughs> what is different about them? Their noses. You know, their nose is very different. And if we look at the adult, the adult has relatively small eyes and a big long snout, right? And we look at the babies, they have big eyes, and a relatively short snout, right? Puppies are like that. If you look at a brand new puppy, they have a short nose and big eyes. They're cute, right? Some scientists think that, that animals feed their young if they're cute. And that's why we get fed when we're little, because we're kind of cute, right? Yeah, well, you know, when you get to be 18, then they're not cute anymore. Only now are we beginning to ask the questions about dinosaurs that we naturally ask about our animal kingdom. For if they lived in families, how did they communicate with one another? David Weissample thinks he knows, at least for a close relative of the good mother known as Parasaurolophus. 
This plant eater was 30 feet long, and on its head it had one feature that seemed made for sound, a crest three feet long. How did you come to this theory that the dinosaur made sound through what would look like a horn? Right. Well, we've got this skull. This is an animal called Parasaurolophus. And all this is bone. So that we know that when the animal breathed, breathed in, the air came in through the nostrils, went all the way to the back of the crest, and then came down this bit here, came to the back of the throat, down the windpipe into the lungs. And when it breathed out, it reversed that pattern came back here and out here. So that if you put some sort of voice box, a sound generator here, the sound's pushed all the way through the crest and has to make that kind of sound. You can do some calculations, do some arithmetic to figure out what kinds of sounds they might have made. But the real, the real clincher is to actually take this kind of configuration, this kind of shape, this skeletal stuff, and then make yourself a horn as well. Okay, this is a big contraption that I've made, which is the same size. It's life-size of the crest of this duckbill dinosaur, Parasaurolophus. Okay, here we go. Uh, pretty low note, right? Yeah, can right. I try it? Hang on a second. Well, you, you guys know how this would go on a Parasaurolophus? Yeah. Let me show you on Brent here, all right? Brent, turn your head a little bit, all right? <laughs> Sort of go like this, right? Where the voice box is down here, kind of where Brent's is. Goes up. And they go all the way out to here and then back down and out through his nose, right there. Ew. Right? Ew. You guys want? I'm going to try it. Brent, you want to try it? Me too. Stand up. <laughs> this is the end. Buzz your lips. There you go. Whoa. <laughs> was that for real or was that just for the kids? Well, no, no, that's actually based on a fair bit of fact from uh, skeletal remains that we have of that particular dinosaur. But science, of course, wants to know more. In North America, dinosaur bones get VIP treatment on the latest X-ray scanners. This is the only complete skull of a honking hadrosaur. My sample dare not cut it open but the x-ray pictures let him see the horn from the inside. What we want to do today is to investigate roughly this part of the crest right here because there's, there's a chance that there are intricate side passages in here which would change the kinds of sound that the animal would make. Well, I think the business about the, the central chamber extending so far up the crest is going to make di a real difference in terms of the kinds of sounds that this animal can make. Yeah. Uh, certainly not as simple as originally anticipated. The business of actually taking pictures from the inside out is something that I hadn't, is not generally available for the kinds of work that we're doing. And so this provides a, a picture, a window on, on the anatomy that's not available otherwise. So yeah, it's a, a tremendous value. Let me ask you this though. The, a dinosaur like Parasaurolophus would want to talk to, if it was a baby, it would want to talk to the grown-ups. Husband and wife would want to talk to each other. And they'd want to say things like, they'd, they'd want to give out warning calls, or they'd want to say, come over here, it's time to eat, it's time to to or it's time to go to bed, or uh, uh, buzz off, this is, uh, I want to be left alone, things like that. I love you. Maybe even I love you. <laughs>